Secret Golf with Elk and Noxie, the podcast. How are you doing? I'm Diane, or Noxie, and it's the week before the Masters. Everyone's getting very excited. But before that, we do have the Houston Open. And I have to say, Elk's um, very excited about that too, because it's in his hometown, the big event that he's been looking forward to. So we're going to talk about that in just a little while. But on the podcast today, we are joined by Jason Duffner. Really happy to have Duff on, especially because I was actually looking back and our first ever our secret golf podcast was with Jason. He was our special guest for the launch. So it's good to have him back on. We're going to be talking to Duff about his recent form, how his game's looking, um, his performance at the Dell Technologies match play just last week. Also his master's preparation, how that's coming along. I know he's been doing a lot of work on his backswing in particular. So Elk's going to talk to him about that. We're going to talk about the Jason Duffner Foundation, which is his charity that he has founded. And it's amazing. It's such a great foundation. I've actually been doing some work on a video for that. Um, So we'll get Jason to talk about his foundation. And then also the thing that I'm most excited about, Duff's Hat Game. It's been generating an awful lot of interest on social media. Jason doesn't have a hat sponsor this year. So some of his uh, choices of headwear have been very interesting and they've got people talking. So all of that coming up on today's Secret Golf Podcast. But yeah, as I said, Houston Open and Elk and Duff. I caught up with them yesterday for this podcast and they were on some sort of secret mission, which I'm still none the wiser about. We were at a secret location, Diane, um, in Texas, uh, filming some exclusive Jason Duffner content today. Exclusive Jason Duffner content. I like the sound of it. Um, Obviously, the Houston Open about to start in a few days. And Elk, you're out and about with the big show. I am. um, I got to spend a few days over in Austin last week. Uh, I got to see Jason. Uh, I got to see a lot of our players. Uh, He had a a decent week. We'll probably hear about what his thoughts are over the week here in a minute. But uh, I think he's looking pretty good heading up to Augusta. Well, it's only a couple of weeks away, and that's really, I think that's what you're looking at. Uh, yeah, um, match play is match play. You can play well and get beat. You can play poorly and move on. Um, you see a little bit of that with the, with the match play. So uh, I was happy with how I played. Um, we got Houston this week, which is a good golf course. I had a good finish there last year. And then obviously getting ready for the Masters in two weeks. Uh, all the guys are trying to peak for that week, so... What are you trying to do? I mean, I know when I play what Shoot I was Shoot low scores. Huh? Shoot low scores. <laughs> uh, is there anything in particular, you were with Chuck Cook, I was with Chuck, uh, who is a, a contributing coach to Secret Golf now. Uh, what, what, what are you and Chuck working on? Because you guys were working pretty hard last week. Yeah, the biggest thing for me, golf swing wise, is just my back swing, getting um, that in the correct position. Um, I tend to get a little bit off with my back swing, which makes my downswing uh, a little bit tougher to get where I want to be at impact. Um, Trying to get the club a little bit more laid off for me is always a good thing. Um, I just have this bad habit of wherever I go in my backswing, whether it be vertical, on plane, laid off, all those different variables you get, I'll come straight down from there. There's no shift in the plane for me. So it's real important for me to be on the plane or maybe even a little bit laid off at the top Um, because that ensures that when I'm coming down, I'm not going to be off the plane as much in the impact. I'm not going to have to manipulate. Um, It's been a little bit more difficult for me the last couple years. Um, But the tough thing is, is we're talking about an inch, maybe two inches. A few degrees, right? That's hard to feel. Um, So you got to stay on top of it with the video and with the track man, things like that. And then obviously with Augusta, you're working a lot on short game trying to make sure that you can get the right spin, uh, right height, all the different shots you need 
um, and then some lag putting stuff. So, is it true that most tour players like yourself keep doing the same thing wrong? It's not like you're inventing new problems, or is it? No, I don't think so. Um, I think most of the guys week in and week out are pretty close with their golf games. Like I said, it could be a couple degrees. It could be something in the setup before even the swing motion starts. Um, a lot of the guys are just really splitting hair, especially the guys that are top 50 or top you know, 100 in the world. They're, they've, they're playing pretty good golf to be at that position, and then it's just a matter of, you know, are you, maybe your address position might vary a little bit, ball position, aim lines. Um, and the biggest thing really is, to be honest, is putting, you know. Are you making? Um, your share. Your share. Um, and that could be from any of the distances, you know. Usually the guys that are competing and finishing very high week in and week out are at a high rate inside of that eight foot range. And then maybe they're throwing in one outside of 20 feet every day instead of making none outside of 20 feet. So all those little things are what you're hoping that can click for the week of a major. And you said a minute ago that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of tour players, uh, it doesn't really matter too much where they take the backswing to a certain degree. It does in your case, but a lot of tour players will go up. We know Bubba Watson, we know uh, Justin Thomas, they go up and then they lay that shaft down and that would it, it's true to say that most really good tour players all come down with that lay down feel but in your case you said something a few minutes ago that said that you don't do the lay down you, your backswing is your downswing yeah wherever my hand position is at the top that's kind of where i come from um if i went really upright with my left arm and got my hands really high i'd, I'd be really steep to the plane um, i got into a bit of a habit where i was getting really inside trying to get that thing laid off. And then because I was so inside, I'd go up, which becomes an issue for me. So i um, trying to get a flat left wrist at the top and trying to feel like I'm a little bit laid off. Cause if I'm on that plane line, on uh, the top of my backswing, I'm gonna be pretty good. I can come down. Um, when I'm vertical, I got all kinds of issues. I start undercutting it with my hands. I get under the plane cause I know that feels steep and I'm gonna hit it left if I don't do it. Um, then you get all kinds of new variables with, with spin rates and uh, club face angles and all these weird One thing nasty messes things. up 12 things. Yeah, a little bit. And also, you know, I worked on my alignment a little bit, um, trying to close off a little bit more. I feel like I had gotten maybe just a touch too open. Um, and also it kind of helped me with the intent of what I wanted to do to get the handle closer to me, getting the shaft going left. I felt like I was closed a little bit. I kind of almost want to have a little bit of an over the top move, which I'm going to play better with as opposed to playing under the plane and, and having some, some layback in the face and, and changing loft like that. You and me, uh, footprints never stand in the same footprint on a tee if we walked in, because I'm way open and you're a little closed. I remember when you went to Bob Hope a few years ago, you had a, a distinct outlook to your swing, but really it was probably zeroed out. Is that true on the track? Probably look pretty close to that. Um, I play better from that side. Anytime I get underneath, I'm gonna be struggling. The handle gets high for me. Um, the shots can go right or left. Generally speaking, they'll start out going right, and then I'll get tired of that and throw my hands at it. You'll see a lot of roll and club face. Uh, flash is what we call it. and um, Flash meaning you can't control it like the flash of a camera. Exactly. Ah, what happened there? You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know if it's going to... And a lot of times those balls start left. The club face is pointing left to the path. Um, so last week was pretty good. We, we were on top of it. I got there early. We worked pretty hard. Um, it was a pretty solid week of work for me. Um, and maybe it didn't pay many dividends last week, but... Hopefully this week in Houston we'll see some better stuff and leading into Augusta and also Hilton Head. Could have, could have turned out a little different. Of course, people that don't know, you got beat in, it was a round robin format, you got beat in the first match and then you won, uh, you beat uh, Jason Day, which was a good victory. Anytime you play, beat one of the top players, that's great. Uh, then you beat, uh, in the third? James Hahn. James Hahn, and then you actually got beaten in a playoff uh, by Louis Oosthuizen, which you could have, you know, you never know what happens if you win a playoff, right? You could be you could be sitting on 500k under your seat right now. Yeah, it's close. I mean, that's just how the setup is. They've done that group play the last couple of years. Um, we went into a playoff, so it was kind of anybody's windy. Yeah, you know, windy. Caught a gust on the playoff hole, spun the ball. Ball didn't act like any ball had all week, and 
kind of got spinny on me and came up about five yards short. And down she went, and he made a 12-footer for par, and I missed a 12-footer, so that's the difference. Jason, um, I have to talk to you about the one thing that everyone seems to be going on about. I feel like every week I'm checking your tea time, and then a little bit afterwards I'm on Twitter searching straight away to see what hat you're wearing. <laughs> So the hat thing right now, you don't have a, a hat sponsor and you've just been wearing a variety of hats. We've had Notorious B.I.G. You had the boss hat. You've had um, I Love Mex when you were playing in Mexico. And then uh, this weekend at the match play, the EDM DJ Marshmallow. Right. So we've had a, a, a wide variety of hats. How are you picking them? Uh, these are all hats that I have at home that I wear at home. Um for the exception of a couple here and there. I don't have a I Love Mexico hat at home that I wear regularly, but um, most of them are just hats you would see me at home with playing. Um, so it's just one of those things, like I don't have a hat sponsor, probably best idea to wear a hat out there to keep the sun off my face. So I just kind of pick and choose whatever I want, whatever matches what I might be wearing. Diane, I scored him a hat. He sent me on a secret mission, doing a secret mission again here. He sent me on a secret mission to get a particular hat, and I have it. I got it for him last week. Ask him about that one. Okay, right. I want to know what it yeah. is. Yeah, so um, we'll probably wear that hat this week. Um, Lee Trevino has been somebody that I've gotten to know a little bit, and uh, he's got the Sombrero logo. Um, that he used to wear, I think, in the 70s and 80s when he was playing. Mary Max. Probably when he was uh, sponsorless also. So um, I scored one of those from Elk. Um, so I'll probably bring that out maybe here in Houston or maybe Fort Worth or Dallas would be a good spot. So that one will be out. But it kind of varies. It, it doesn't have really any rhyme or reason. Not much of it's planned. Um, the one I won, the one I wore when I played with Tiger was just kind of luck that it was laying around at Ricky's house and grabbed it and happened to be playing Tiger, so you know you're going to get a bunch of grief exposure for that, you know. So it was fun. What Tiger say when he saw the he boss just hat? He laughed. <laughs> he laughed. Um, so it, it's been good. It's gotten on a lot of exposure. It's not really what I had planned for. I didn't think wearing hats that I wear at home would be that big a deal, but. Obviously, out on tour, a lot of guys are sponsored and wearing the same type of thing, and it's a little bit different. So I guess people like a little different every once in a while. Also, the, the marshmallow hat that you wore at the weekend of the match play, he actually tweeted. He was so happy that you were wearing his hat and he was getting all this exposure all over the world on TV. Yeah, he's been pretty good about it. Uh, What'd you wear? It's a DJ who's not really a person. It's more of a brand. His name's Marshmallow. He's one of my favorite... Um, DJ, musicians, whatever. He's got like 8 million followers on Instagram and another million on Twitter. So he's been pumping my brand a little bit for me too. Are people sending you loads of hats? Yeah, most people send me a lot of hats. Um, unfortunately, most of those hats go in the trash can. It's not really about what they're sending me. It's about what I want to wear. Uh, unless there's a check attached to the hat, um, probably going to go in the trash can. <laughs> And have you started to think about the hats you're going to wear at the Masters? Yeah, that'll be pretty simple. I don't want to get kicked out from there. So it'll probably be a Augusta National hat or a Masters tournament hat. We'll, we'll keep it pretty respectful. He's got some pretty sexy shoes, though, he's, he showed me today. I'm not telling you what they, are, what they look like, though. Sexy shoes. I love it. Um, Jason, another thing I want to talk to you about is here at Secret Golf, we've been working on, on a video over the past few weeks for the Jason Duffner Foundation. Now, I was lucky enough that we were out in Auburn with you, at, what, about a year and a half ago, maybe? And we got to see your charitable work in action. And we've put together this little video that we're going to release before your Celebrity Golf Classic the end of April. For those that don't know, tell us a little bit about the Jason Duffner Foundation and what your aims are. Yeah, we've been... Um had the foundation since 2009, uh, ended at 09, beginning at 10, and, and our main mission, we stay right there in Lee County, which is um, where I live at. Um, and Alabama. We, Alabama. And we feed about 1,200 kids every week during the school year. Um, they qualify for our program first through fifth grade. Uh, we pack the food on, on Thursdays, give it out on Fridays, so they have food that they can um, eat on the weekends. I think it's about... Uh, five or six meals that we pack for them. So 
um, non-perishable goods. Um, and then also we do a summer feeding program where we feed about a thousand more kids through various churches and boys and girls clubs and things like that. So we, we take care of the cost for the food for their summer programs. So uh, on April 30th uh, in, in Auburn, Alabama, we'll have our event. It's our big fundraiser. Um, we have a bunch of the guys on tour, some Auburn football guys that come and play. Um, we're usually sold out. We usually do 25, 26 groups. Uh, and that's where we raise the majority of the money um, that goes to those programs. So a couple of things that I'm proud of with, with what we do is first off, it stays local to the community that I live in. None of the money that we raise goes outside of Lee County. It's all spent right there. And then also there's no overhead for the foundation. So if you donate a dollar, um, we're putting a dollar towards the program. Um, all the overhead's covered by me. Um, I pay all the employees we have and any of the events we do, I cover all of that. So, um, you know, it's not one of those things where maybe 50% or 40% of what's donated goes to it. So those are the two things I'm really proud of. I'm glad to be able to give back, use my platform to do that. And uh, we're excited. We should have a great event. We got some good commitments um, from some of the big names on the PGA Tour. I think Elk's going to come like, over. Like me, for example. Yep, yeah. Steve Elkington. He's a big draw. <laughs> so it'll be a fun day. It's pretty casual. We play a scramble and um, just share what we're doing and, and get some of the the PGA stars to come out and help us out. Yeah, it is amazing. Elk, we were there and um, we were lucky enough to be involved with one of the bag packings. And what I love is the fact that, you know, you went to Auburn, you're okay. Auburn through and through, and the bag packing takes place actually at Auburn and you get all the athletes from the various teams packing the bags for you. And it, it's just great to have that community spirit and see so many people come together and get involved in such a great cause. Yeah, it's great. Jason's doing doing a great job down there in Alabama. Now, um, as we move gears here, Jason, to the Houston Open this week, uh, wh what's the ideal week for you here? Um, yeah. Know, trophy. Yeah, trophy would be good. <laughs> um, you know, one one thing today, we're, we're knocking this out. We're local here. You're local here, so I can knock out uh, doing some content. So Mondays are usually a travel day. Pretty short travel from Austin, so we'll Traveled over this morning, knocked this out this afternoon. Tomorrow will be a pretty light day. Um, just work on the same things we've been working on. I try to stay really consistent with my practice. Um, it's easier when Chuck's here with me because he keeps me on task. He keeps me on line. He's kind of my eyes. I can't watch my golf swing. Um, I can see some numbers on track, man, but I can't really see what I'm doing. Um, and what you feel and see sometimes is so different. So it's good to have him here. He, he's my eyes. Let me know that I'm still working in the right direction. Um, Tuesday will be pretty light. We'll do some practice, some work, probably play nine holes. Um, great thing about this week's event is only a nine-hole pro-am on Wednesday. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. That'll be one of my first nine-hole pro-ams. So we'll play whatever nine, um, the opposite nine of what we're playing on Tuesday. We'll do a pro-am on Wednesday, and then we'll be getting ready to compete. Um, I try to compete starting on Thursday. I try to get all of this uh, coaching stuff out of my head and all the mechanics out of my head and, and try to play. You want to be free. You kind of want to be on a, on a you know, no-thinking attitude and competing and trying to get the ball in the hole because that's the name of the game. Automatic mode. As automatic opposed, mode. As and, opposed to non-automatic mode, right? A lot, of, a lot of us, we get to thinking about our swing and... Working on, you see guys working on their swing positions out, and that's probably more non-automatic, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay if you have one thought, maybe, that or a feeling. If you do this, everything's going to be great. Yeah. So last week, I was really focused on my back swing a good bit. Um, that'll probably be the same for this week. But you'd like to have no thoughts and feelings and just be... Aim it. Aim it and target, uh, you know, acquiring targets out there. So that would be perfect. And, you know, there's some work uh, off the course with keeping my body where I want it to be, just making sure that I'm feeling good, I'm not too fatigued. That's one thing you gotta watch, especially leading into a major. You feel like you gotta do all this practice, all this preparation, and maybe by the time, you might not see it on Thursday or Friday, but maybe the back nine on Saturday, you start lagging a little bit. So mm -hmm. trying to just manage that and manage the travel and manage the schedule. I got four weeks coming up, so I wanna make sure that I feel good for all four weeks and not just these first two. Um, those are all things that people don't really take into account as to what it takes to be successful. Uh, I, <clears throat> I have a question about the Masters. There's going to be so much hype this year. You know, with Tiger 
playing well, Phil playing well, everyone, you name them, all the top players are playing well. Is this a chance for someone like you to go in there and get your work done while all that hype's going off over to the side and maybe sneak off and just blitz it right out of the gate? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, I think if you're in the field, for the most part, you got a pretty good chance. This is my, I don't know, seventh or eighth time around um, Augusta National, so I kind of know what to expect. I know how it's going to play for the most part. I've seen it in a lot of conditions. There aren't many tricks, so for me it's going to be more about execution, how well I can execute. Um, I'm hoping for kind of a firm and fast Augusta National. That helps me a little bit. Last year was pretty firm and fast. Uh, I made 19 birdies and an eagle, but I finished about 30th. <laughs> Shot over par. Um, so is, it, is it an iron game for you over there? If you could hit your irons into good spots, you can, you can putt good enough to win that tournament if, if the iron game's on. Is that true? Yeah, definitely. It's a second shot golf course. Um, I think driving it far has a bit of an advantage, not because um, driving it far is needed. It just makes your iron play a little bit easier. Uh, the closer you are, generally speaking, the closer you hit it to the pin. If you have a seven iron instead of a five iron, on the average, you're probably going to be better. So if I can get it playing a little firm and fast and hitting, you know, a nine iron, an eight iron, a seven iron into number one, whereas to two or three years ago when it's soft, I was hitting a four iron. That's a big difference. Um, I can reach all the par fives if it gets to playing firm and fast. Um, and then the greens don't really play firm and fast like they used to. They backed them off a little bit, I think. They probably don't want us talking about that. But with the added length that they've had, I feel like, the greens have been backed off a little bit on how firm they get, how fast they get. So firm and fast doesn't necessarily mean the greens are going to be playing firm and fast. They're always pretty consistent throughout the whole week. Um, but I need those fairways to be rolling a little bit. It makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of guys that are playing well. There's going to be... How much hype is there out think, there with yeah, Tiger? A lot, of hype, a lot of hype with him. How much? Like mega hype? Yeah, man. He's the needle mover for us. Is it true that even Tiger, where he is with his game right now, he can manage himself around Augusta because he knows it so well to get himself in position? If there was a tournament that he could play really well at, it, this would be it. Would it is yeah, I think so. He's got a little bit more room with the driver. Um, he's been pretty good with his irons. He's been really good with his pitching and chipping and putting. Um, and he has the experience of playing that golf course and knowing how that golf course is going to play. Um, he's really good mentally. He's probably the best that maybe has ever played that I've seen um, mentally at managing his game. I mean, if you look at his stats this year, driving the ball has been not that great. Um, hadn't hit a lot of greens and regulations, but he's managed his game, not making a lot of mistakes, not making a lot of bogeys. So I think he'll probably be in the mix. I think he probably needs his driver to be a little bit better because that can be a weapon out there. Um, he probably wants to hit his driver as much as he can because that'll – bring those shorter clubs into play. He'll be hitting wedges and nine irons and eight irons into a lot of holes. So that would be a big advantage. But there's so many guys that are playing well right now, young guys. Seems like the 40-something crew is is having a revival this year. Bubba's, I think, just turned 40 maybe. He just won the Phil's, match play. Phil just won. Phil, Tiger. Rory's going for the Grand Slam. A lot of hype. A lot of hype for this year as a master. So it should be, hopefully it'll live up to it. And hopefully I can be in the mix. What else you got, Diane? Well, that's really it. I, I should probably leave you guys to um, resume your secret mission. <laughs> you know, Sean White, the, the famous guy that does the, uh, the snowboarder, you know, he has a secret place where he, does his, where he trains up in the mountains. Yeah, we have a secret place like his now. That's where we do our training. <laughs> I look a lot better than Sean White does, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is the this is the, not the flying tomato. Oh, this is the this stronger. is the flying potato. This is Duff's the flying potato. <laughs> flying potato. You like that? The flying potato. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys have fun, Jason. Good luck this week at the Houston Open, and of course at Augusta. We'll see you then. Thank you. See you. He is one of my favourite people on tour. Jason Duffner, great to have him on today's podcast. Looking at what he's been working on recently, talking about his charitable foundation and also getting prepared for the Masters. Well, his ideal preparation would, of course, be winning the Houston Open this weekend. So excellent. Um, I love the fact, too, that we were educating Elk on EDM and DJs with the marshmallow hat 
chat. The hats are brilliant. And as Jason said, it's something a little bit different and it's definitely got people talking. I just want to give you the website address for the Jason Duffner Foundation and also all the information you can get on the Celebrity Golf Classic that's taking place in Auburn at the Auburn University Club on the 30th of April. If you go to jasonduffnerfoundation.com, all the information is there, how you can get involved and also how you can make a donation to the foundation for the food bag packing that they do. As I said, um, a little about a year and a half ago, maybe not even that, we went to Auburn and spent a couple of days with Jason Duffner at his home and also at Auburn University. And we were part of the bag packing and it's an incredible thing that he does. He's very selfless with it. And there was a, a great story that I heard. There's an organisation that he supports and it's called Our House. And basically a lot of kids will go to this house in the neighbourhood after school. They get help with their homework. They get fed and they just get the help with life in general. And one day Jason called up to say, hey guys, I'm in town. You know, would it be OK for me to go and buy some burgers and some French fries for all the kids? And they were like, well, yeah, of course. So he went and he ordered this like ridiculous amount of food and brought it round himself to the kids. They ate together, they played basketball and th the great thing is the kids don't really know who he is. <laughs> They're just like, oh yeah, this cool guy that comes around and he's got a nice car and he plays basketball and gives us hamburgers and french fries. So as I said, brilliant work and all the information is online at jasonduffnerfoundation.com. So another podcast coming this week, I'm going to be chatting to Patton Kazire. Patton's had two wins this season, number two in the FedEx Cup rankings right now and heading into his rookie masters. So going to chat to Patton about how he's feeling and all the preparation, really everything that goes with being a champion on tour and also with playing Augusta National for the first time. So that's coming in the next few days. Thank you for listening. All of our podcasts are on iTunes. If you don't subscribe, then please do so. Just search for Secret Golf and yeah, we'll be back soon. <laughs>